Okay, so uh, we're finally in some kind of, so this course has been going on for um, over a year now in a somewhat stop-start manner, but we're finally getting close to uh, Bezrogavnikov's equivalents. Um, so, and this will involve quite a lot of jumping between coherent and constructible. And we've spent the last few weeks on the constructible and I will spend another hour on the constructible now and then I'll try to outline what we'll do for the next uh, three weeks or so which will be much more on the coherent side. Um, and also as we are starting to enter deeper water um, you'll need to go back and look at the notes or um, take some things on faith and there's a reasonable amount of stuff that we've covered um, that I'll be using and that's maybe I, the, the last time I covered it was before Christmas. Uh, so that won't happen so much today, but in the next weeks. So I'm just kind of warning you a little bit that either you'll need to take a more relaxed attitude to the course or you'll need to work. Uh, so I just want to recall what we saw last time. So we have X a stratified variety. Um, so this is a stratified complex algebraic variety. And then we have um, the category of perverse sheaves, lambda constructible perverse sheaves. And throughout we fix K is a field of coefficients. Throughout. So we have the category of, so this is the abelian category of perverse sheaves inside the constructible derived category. And last time, so we have this realization functor. From DB perv of x and we saw uh, so this is rarely an equivalence so last time we I explained that if you just have a single strata, then this is equivalent. This is equivalent basically when your strata is um, k pi one, so it has no higher homotopy groups beyond the fundamental group. Um, and in general, the question of when this is an equivalence is rather subtle. But one should think that in a for a general stratification, one has no reason to believe that this is a strat that this this will be an equivalence. And last time. I outlined a proof of Balinson's theorem that this becomes an equivalence if we allow arbitrary refinement of our stratification. So dB perv x is equivalent to dB c of x and Today, I first want to prove the following theorem, or at least outline how to prove it, um, that if um, the x lambda are affine spaces, so this is the theorem which I'll call BGS's theorem, If the x lambda are affine spaces, 
So we have a stratification of our space via affine spaces. Then dB, then the realization functor is an equivalence. Okay. So um, you can take this a little bit with a grain of salt, but roughly speaking, the issue is, uh, we saw last time that the issue is the strata may not be K pi one. And somehow affine spaces are contract contractible. So there's no fundamental group information. There's no high homotopy groups. So, so everything is okay. Um, but yeah, that should be taken with a grain of salt. The proof is very different. And here, uh, here the proof was geometric via vanishing cycles. Remember the key point was to show that if I have an X, a higher X um, between two perverse sheaves on a sub variety, then actually I can write this X only involving sheaves on that sub variety. And we did this using vanishing cycles. And here the proof is algebraic. Via so-called um, highest weight categories. I should have said, um, you probably all know this, but you can pin the this video up. Um, I guess everyone's muted, but uh, yeah. So if, if for whatever reason this that slide keeps disappearing, then you can just pin it up. Um, okay. And um, one thing I haven't gone into any detail with is, uh, the construction of this um, realization functor. And basically it's um, some amount of uh, reasonably non-trivial homological algebra. So we really need that this category of perverse sheaves is the heart of a triangle, is the heart of a T-structure on a triangulated category with enhancement. So Balinson's way of constructing this functor is so called is via so called filtered triangulated categories. Um, but one way of thinking about this realization functor is that if we replace perverse sheaves, so perverse sheaves are equivalent to certain D modules. So I just want to, um, this is just a remark for, so this is an entirely optional remark. So, uh, So perv lambda of X is equivalent to a certain category of D modules. So regular holonomic and so holonomic with regular singularities and, um, and constructible with this res with respect to this stratification. And now, um, so that means here I can write dB of certain D modules okay and because I have an abelian equivalence here this induces a equivalence of derived categories here but here I have um, Riemann Hilbert Okay, so um, here I have a solutions functor and this is one way of constructing realization. So this is like a high concept um, way once you understand D modules and things of believing that this realization functor exists. So this is the, the goal of today is, um, is this theorem. So there is a version of Riemann-Hilbert with um, 
stratifications, which is not an equivalence, but then exactly. when, you, when you sort of allow everything, then it becomes an equivalence. Exactly. Yeah. So certainly the solution functor from lambda, const lambda from the derived category of lambda constructible D modules lands in lambda constructible constructible sheaves. This is not an equivalence, but when you pass to the full category of D modules, it is. Um, and one final remark is that uh, whilst Bailinson's theorem was, uh, so Bailinson's theorem, I just, I really like this theorem and I really like um, to understand the proof better, which is basically why I explained it. And it's also a very nice example of somehow the non-trivial non nature of establishing, establishing an equivalence of drive categories. Um, but we'll use the realization factor constantly, the existence of the realization factor, but we won't actually use Bailinson's theorem in what follows. But we'll use this BGS theorem the entire time in what follows. So this is actually something that um, will be important for the sequel. Okay. Yeah, and so as um, I'm sure you're aware, there's notes on the um, on the course website that are more detailed than what I give here. Um, so you can either take a screenshot of this as if if you're going if you're going to want to need this or um, or look at the notes. Okay, so I'm moving on. Okay, so I want to go over the notion of a highest weight category. And this is the, this will be the technique to show BGS theorem. And it's also of extensive independent interest. So we have, um, so we have A is a K linear abelian category. And A is highest weight if so firstly, I'll give you a kind of minimal list of necessary conditions, and then I'll explain a theorem which will give you the definition of highest weight that you may have seen otherwise. And somehow this minimal list of conditions is very useful because um, these are the things that you often check in practice, particularly in geometric examples. So one, we, we have three easy conditions. So A, is finite length. So every object has a composition series. Two, um, the simples up to isomorphism, this set of simples is finite. So we have a finite length abelian category with finite and many simple objects. And three, the endomorphism algebra of a simple is K. Now we have, so these are the easy things. Now we get to the trickier things. So um, let lambda be an indexing set for the simples. So given lambda, in lambda we associate L lambda simple in A for And we um, and we assume 
So this is part of the structure of being a highest weight category, that lambda is a Poe set. And for any closed subset in, inside this Poe set, i.e. if lambda is less than lambda is in T, that implies that lambda prime is in T. So this is what closed means. So it's closed by, you know, it's a post set and then it's closed by taking less than or equal to. Um, and then we denote by a t, a sub t, the full subcategory generated by lambda in t. So this is Sarah. So this is this is the full subcategory consisting of objects that have a composition series whose successive quotients lie in t. And now we assume given for each. Lambda in lambda, um, we assume that we're given objects delta lambda and nabla lambda plus maps nabla lambda. So these are called. Um, We'll, we'll repeatedly call these standard and co-standard objects. And now um, comes the kind of meat of the definition so for is that if T is inside here is closed, then this map from delta of lambda to L of lambda, respectively, uh, is closed and lambda in T is maximal. then this map respectively, this map is a projective cover, respectively injective hull in a Okay, so we're not requiring that um, delta lambda be projective, but we're requiring that in the subcategory consisting of generated by L lambdas and those below L lambda, then delta lambda is projective. So it's a little bit like, I, I'm not sure if you've seen, like this, there's a reason why this is called a highest weight category, but if we, we fix some highest weight and look at only modules of weights less than that highest weight, then for example, the Verma module of that highest weight is projective. Okay, because taking highest weights is, is an exact functor on that, on that category. Uh, and now we have some easy, so condition five is easy and then condition six is mysterious. So, the kernel of this map lies in A less than lambda and the co-kernel. So this condition implies that these maps are in fact surjections and injections. Um, the co-kernel of So this says that um, in egg diagrams, this shows 
says that L, this is L lambda on top and then L mu with mu lambda be below and Okay, and then this, the last condition, which um, has somehow caused me rather a lot of suffering in my math mathematical life, because it's the one thing that you always need to check. And once you've got it, it's everything else follows, but it's rather difficult in general to check, is that X two delta lambda two is zero. Okay, so I'm hoping that, um, all of these conditions are reasonably intuitive, except for perhaps condition six. Okay, so now, um, this is the definition of highest weight, so I'm about to move on to the next page. Jordi, can I just ask a question before you do? Sure. Um, in condition four, um, I mean, obviously, a special case of that is when T it just consists of all the things less than or equal to lambda. Um, mm -hmm. So do you, you actually need the extra assumption that it holds for all, um, you know, for, for closed T that also contains some other stuff incomparable to lambda? I'm pretty sure you do, yeah, when you want to make the induction. Because you... you um, so the, the honest answer is I don't know, but I suspect that we do need this stronger condition. Okay. Yeah, so what Anthony is saying is that a very natural choice for such a T would be the set of things less than or equal to lambda. And he's asking whether um, whether we could replace T here with this set. And I don't know. Um, okay, so I won't go through the proof of the following theorem, um, which is very nice. So, so this is um, one of the theorems in the paper Baylis and Ginzburg Zogel, which is rather um, famous and fantastic paper. Um, so if A is highest weight, then A has enough projective and injectives. Moreover, the projective cover of L lambda standard filtration. So um, what I mean by that, so what it looks like is that in terms of egg diagrams, it has a delta of lambda at the top. And then it has delta of mu's with mu above lambda. So I'm going to draw another picture of this in a second. So um, I mean, the most important thing to, to, to remember is that um, it has a standard filtration. And the second most important thing to remember is that in this standard filtration, only standard modules occur which are above lambda. And then the third most important thing to remember is that you can order these in your filtration 
to be in kind of increasing order from the head down or something. But this, this will become clearer in what I, what I say. So this is the, this is P lambda. This is the projective color. Looks like this. And then um, we can say the same thing for similarly. So for um, injective hull, I lambda has a co standard. Filtration. So I'll get there eventually. Okay. So this is the um, important theorem. And I just want to give, um, so for the proof, CBGS, but the idea is the following. So um, we construct P lambda T, so this is the of inductively on T. Okay, so we have this filtration by the subcategories AT. And what we do is we slowly build our projective starting off. So we have a starting point because our projective in um, the set less than or equal to lambda, our projective, uh, we, we have our projective, it's delta of lambda. And now what we want to do is slowly make this um, module bigger um, as we increase our post set. So assume and so the inductive step is the following. So assume that P lambda T take away mu is already constructed. Okay, so we have our post set here, and we have some mu here and so here's T and mu inside T is maximal. And then here's our T without mu. And then we have our lambda somewhere here. And we've constructed our projective cover inside this category. And what we, what we would like to do is extend it somehow to be a projective cover here. And
And now, because this is um, projective, so we, we, we already know that the X groups against um, any standard module will be, will be zero for all standard modules except for delta of mu. And so the crucial X group is this one. So we set E to be X one of our approximation to a to a projective with delta of mu. And now, whenever you build, whenever you have an X group, there's a there's a universal extension. So we can now consider. Okay, so this, this X group here measures extensions of short exact sequences of this form. And it turns out that there's a, a way to make the kind of biggest possible such extension, which encompasses all of these, all of the potential X's encoded in the vector space. And this is this universal extension. So, what we've done is we've taken p lambda t take away mu and we've put copies of e star tensor delta of mu below. And note that this is exactly what we kind of expect um, this projective to look like from up here. You know, we, we're, we start with delta of lambda and then as we go up the post set, we put standard modules um, below. Okay. And now we argue via long exact sequences plus the mysterious condition six that P lambda is in fact the projective cover inside our new Okay, and the argument is not um, not difficult. It's about two paragraphs. I just don't want to go through it here. Are there any questions based on this um, slide? Why is e non-zero? Ah, uh, uh, um, e need not. So if e is zero, then we, then um, you can see reasonably directly. That um, that in fact this guy is already projective in in AT. So okay. I actually don't know who asked the question, but is, are you satisfied? I can't see you. Sounds good. Okay, so it's a really beautiful. This BGS construction is really beautiful. So you can do a dual argument for constructing injective objects, and you can also um, do a dual argument for a, a, a similar argument for constructing tilting objects. So it's a very nice argument to get used to. Um, so I just want to draw a picture. So um, pictures of so in a highest weight category. we have the following picture. So I just want to recall that um, an object T is tilting if um, it has a standard 
and a co-standard. Filtration and that um, in decomposable tilting objects are also classified by our set. This is um, not so important um, for what for what immediately follows. It's just, I'm just doing this for kind of mathematical culture. And um, a similar Okay, so now I just want to um, draw a picture which um, which summarizes what is going on. Um, so maybe just move to a new slide. So we have our simple object L lambda. And now we have our subjection from delta of lambda. And what this looks like is so it has an L lambda up the top. And then it has L mu's the mu less than lambda. And then over here we have a similar picture with the Nabla module. We have Sokol L lambda, and then we have L mu's. Mu less than lambda. And now what we saw is that the projective object has the projective cover of delta of lambda has, sorry, the projective cover of L of lambda has delta of lambda at the top plus stuff below. And so we have the projective object here that surjects onto here. And similarly, we have the injective hull of L lambda. And then these, Guys have structure and there's a kind of crucial difference here that now the mu's are bigger than lambda and this has a dual structure And then finally, we have the tilting module. Well, And the tilting module has
He's less than lambda. So that's a co that's a standard filtration and it's co-standard filtration. Okay, um, and I find this diagram really useful just for keeping in my head what everything looks like in a, so this is the standard. And um, and in the presence of a duality, so often you'll have a duality on your category exchanging these. So these are dual, and then projectives and injectives is a dual, and then there's the self dual. which, and the kind of self-duality often explains why we care about tilting modules so much. Okay. Are there questions on this slide? And just, I mean, for, if this is the first time you've seen highest rate categories, probably the most important thing to remember is that the, um, the delta of lambdas have simples below in the order, whereas the projectives have st um, standards above in the order. Okay, um, so now I just want to state that um, perverse sheaves stratified by affine spaces satisfy these conditions. So they form a highest weight category, and then we'll have a break. Jordi, can yes. I see the slide of tiltings again? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so now um, we have a nice little exercise. So imagine that B inside A is a SARE subcategory. And this is just um, a abelian. Otherwise, no assumptions. Okay, I'm not assuming that A is highest weight or anything. Then the exercise is to show that X one. So. If you think in terms of Yoneda extensions that we were discussing last time, it's completely clear that when I have a, a abelian subcategory, um, I get a map on X groups. So I get a map from extensions in A from M and N. So, and we have M, N inside B. So, Oops. So we have a map like this, and that this is an isomorphism. And so my understanding of this um, is that on higher X groups, you can say absolutely nothing. 
but it's a fact that on X2 groups, is injective. Okay. So of course, Holmes agree, X1 agrees, and X2. And uh, maybe someone can tell me why the first one is true. Use the Yonida extension. Please. Yes. Okay, so any Yonida extension has to lie in B already. Okay, because this is a stair subcategory. Um, okay, and this is exactly the issue that we were confronted with last time with Pavashi, is when we have an X2, we no longer know that the middle terms in the Yonida extension actually lie in B, and that's the crucial issue. Um, Okay, and so a hint is used. Remember we, um, we had this condition last time, effaceability plus long exact sequence. And now theorem is that if is a stratification by affine spaces, then perv and the x is highest weighted. So the proof is um, so one is the fact that it's finite length. Two, we know that the category of perverse sheaves has simple objects indexed by pairs consisting of strata and local system, but the, all the strata are simply connected. So all the local systems are trivial. We have finitely many strata, so this is okay. Three, we also know that the endomorphism rings of, um, of IC sheaves agree with the endomorphism ring of the corresponding local system. So this is just the field. And four, we take set, um, so we consider J, J lambda the inclusion of X lambda into X. And this is an affine inclusion. Okay, you can convince yourself that, um, so th there's, a little bit of a con there's a little bit of a confusing point here, for me at least, which is that we would like to know that this morphism is affine, but whenever I have a morphism whose source is an affine variety, then the morphism is automatically affine. So hence, J lambda is affine. And now we define um, the shriek extension And we have morphisms like this. So recall I C lambda is actually the image so we certainly have these morphisms and now um, what do we need to check? We need to check that these are um, projective covers in the category of, so here, 
I mean, I'll just say it. So this AT, so T being closed is, is exactly the condition that the corresponding um, subset inside X be closed, the corresponding union of strata be closed. And in that case, A, AT is perverse sheaves supported on that closed subset. And it's easy to see via rejunction that the shrieks and the stars are projective in that subcategory. Okay, so four is okay. And five is the statement that the kernel, for example, of this map consists of simples which are um, supported on lower strata, which is the case, and the co-kernel of this map is also the case, so five is also okay. And if anybody can tell me why six is true, I'll let you get a cup of tea. So remember six is this mysterious X2 condition. Um, Jordi, sorry, I missed, uh, why did you need that J was affine? Ah. Thank you, Wiggins. So, um, so that implies that these guys are perverse sheaves. Oh, right, yeah. Mm. So, for example, in your world on the nilpotent cone, yeah. when you take a shriek extension, this is yeah. no longer, it's not perverse. Yeah. You need yeah. to truncate it and all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with this fact you cited that uh, a map out, you said map out of affine is always affine. Is that... Yeah, it should be true, no? It's not, it's not totally obvious to me. Uh... Uh, who's speaking at the moment? Oh, this is me, Tony. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, so it should be. Uh, yeah, I think if you if you think about a chart on the sort on the target. Uh -huh. You know, it's affine, being an affine morphism is local. Right. And so we can choose a chart on the target and then it's just given by a morphism of rings and so it's affine. I guess what I, so it should mean like pull, pull back of affine is affine, but if you choose some open on the target, you pull it back and get some kind of open inside some affine space. And I guess I don't see why that would be affine anymore necessarily. Um, isn't that a, isn't that some, isn't that where you use separated, like, if the pool, like, if I have two affine maps and I have, and I have a separated scheme, then the fiber product is affine. Right. I remember this from years ago with Hachon. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, okay, I see. So this fails for non-separated, but it's true for... Ah, oh, okay, great. All right, thanks. Also, I was just kind of curious, uh, so, so you mentioned that you can make like rep G into, well, you can sort of incorporate this theory, rep G into this theory for like a reductive group. But, um, is there something you can do like for a finite group? Um, rep G, what, what, what are you, what, what, where are you talking about rep G? You mean like which coefficients? Oh, sorry. I, I, thought, yeah. I think uh, you were giving an example earlier that if you take the subcategory of Rep G where you bound the highest weight which can appear. Ah, it, okay. Yes. Yes. 
Um, I'm just kind of curious if there's some oh, way of incorporating finite. Can like, you like are kind of representations of finite groups highest weight? Yeah. For example. So maybe I like maybe not literally in the definition, but neither was rep G. So. Yeah. So yeah. So rep G is not quite highest weight, but um, you you just need to give up on finiteness and then you're fine. Uh -huh. um, for finite groups, so one one thing that I didn't state, which is another consequence of this, is that any highest weight category is of finite global dimension. Mm, okay. Um, you can see pretty easily that, yeah. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a fact that you can. That's not too difficult to 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 deduce from this business, this BGS business. And so, um, so finite groups, unless they're semi-simple, so um, these are symmetric algebras, so they're never of finite global dimension, unless they're semi-simple. Mm -hmm. But there's an extremely interesting theory of what people call quasi-hereditary covers, which is basically like if I give you, so, in, in non-commutative geometry, you think about finite global dimension as being smooth. Uh -huh. And so we think about representations of some finite group as being some singular thing. And then a quasi-hereditary cover is something like a resolution of singularities of this category. Uh -huh. And there's a very rich um, theory of, um, of quasi-hereditary covers. Uh, so basically, there's some theorems of of Rookie A, for example, that show you that if you have two quasi-hereditary covers satisfying some mild conditions, then in fact they're equivalent, some kind of unicity of resolution of singularities and things like this. Um, so the theory is very powerful in finite groups, but you need to, it doesn't apply directly. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and maybe another, um, another point to make is that this all comes from um, from category O, and in the first paper on category O, um, um, Bernstein, Gelfand, Gelfand point out their famous reciprocity theorem, and they say that this is inspired by Brouwer reciprocity for finite groups.
Does anyone have an idea for six? Yes, I have. I have an idea. So we can use. So we want to uh, calculate uh, the x the two of a uh, j lower shriek uh, k x lambda and uh, and j lower star k x lambda. Uh huh. So, so we use the adjunction. And uh, we take uh, the uh, the j a uh, lower three a uh, lower star on the right uh, right hand side uh, to the uh, left, and uh, it becomes a j a uh, upper star. Some Or maybe maybe move the other side. So so J uh, move the J lower shriek to the other the other thing. So I just want to say that uh, uh, we will get some uh, cohomology on x lambda, and uh, x lambda is uh, relatively nice. So that that's my idea. Uh huh. Great. Uh, what did I do, 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 J upper shriek. I wanted to do the other one actually. Okay, yeah. So this is um J mu and the shriek. Now, um, so here, what we're doing is we're doing an upper star of a, of a lower shriek. And lower shriek is extension by zero. And so this is zero. Unless mu is equal to lambda, yep. So this, this sheaf here has no stalks whatsoever except on x lambda. And, and this is a sheaf supported on x mu. And so this is zero unless lambda equals mu, um, in which case it's a one dimensional vector space on a, on a contractible strata. And so we're just taking x in vector spaces. And so this is zero. Um, okay, so I guess we're allowed to use this adjunction. Uh, yeah, we're just allowed to use this adjunction. So this is an adjunction between um, on perverse sheaves. Um, and so it descends to the derived category. Okay. Um, I confused myself when preparing the, these notes. I thought we weren't allowed to use this adjunction, but I was going to compare X in this category with this fixed stratification with X in um, the derived category in order to say that um, X2 injects into X when I have no stratification, which agrees with the constructible drive category. But anyway, that, that step was unnecessary, so. Okay, so we're. So just let me point out something which is rather interesting here. So in, in the Braylinson proof, what we were doing was, it was essentially always we were using some geometric op operations. But here we've produced these perverse sheaves by an argument in algebra. And as far as I know, there's no geometric construction of these projective perverse sheaves in general. Okay, so they're, from a geometric perspective, they're still rather mysterious things. Uh, can I ask a question? 
so we know that uh, from the axioms of uh, the uh, highest weight category, in fact, uh, so in six, uh, in six we can, so because in, in the proof, uh, in, the, in the proof of, uh, in this ca particular case, I think we can even uh, prove that uh, the x the ones are zero. Uh, yeah, the x ones are zero. Yeah. And in a moment we'll see all the x i's are zero. Yes, so that's uh, that's in general, so that uh, we can deduce that uh, in general uh, from the axioms of a highest weight category. Yes. And uh, in this case, we can even prove it directly. In this case, we can... For example, the... Uh, we yeah. can even prove it directly. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned, but anyway. Yeah. I mean, I definitely we definitely know it in the derived category. But can we prove it directly before we know that there's an equivalence with the derived category? Okay. So, but but uh, but we can deduce it. Ah, so we do need this. Sorry, I was getting, I was getting, uh, um, yeah. So we actually we actually don't have the right to this line we don't know in um if we're in the derived category of perverse sheaves yeah and we, why don't we know it because this this functor here is not um this functor here is not exact it's only exact if this is an open stratum okay so the correct um i'll just um, right the so yeah I think I was correct in my notes that we really need um, the following line of reasoning that we say x two in this constructible perverse sheaves embeds inside x two arbitrary constructible Perverses. And by Valenson, this is home to in the derived category. Which is zero. Okay. Yeah, so we're only allowed to um, to pass the junctions to the derived category if they're exact functors on the original. And as this is not, and last week when we were using when we were passing these junctions to the derived category, we we're using always using it for the inclusion of an open stratum, which is exact. Yeah, but we can still prove that the hop, uh, the x to one uh, is zero. We can still prove the x1 is zero. Not the That's immediate point. because x1 is still is the same um, as in the um, it's in the set subcategory. Yeah, but not the, other, not the other eyes. Yes, the other eyes. We need an argument, which will come right now. So the corollary in the above setting so an affine stratification the realization functor is an equivalence. Okay. Um, let me just say one more thing based on the back on the previous slide, which is that it's extremely unusual for a category of perverse sheaves to have enough projectives in general. So 
it's rather surprising that in this affine stratified case, you have enough projectives. So proof. Um, the set of standard, it's easy to see that the set of standard modules and the set of co-standard modules generate both sides. And now we have the fact that projective modules are kind of upper triangular in the um, basis of standards. So upper triangularity. Says that the projective objects also the projective per sheaves also generate. Another way of seeing this would be to um, use the fact that this is finite global dimension, which I haven't proved. Um, so it's enough to show Whenever you have a triangulated functor and you have a set of generators, it's enough to show that real induces an isomorphism between hom i in db perv from p lambda to Okay, so this realization functor is always an identity on the triangulated category. On the, sorry, it's always an identity on the, on the heart. And so really I should work right over here, I should work right real of P of lambda and real of nabla of lambda, but um, this is canonically the same thing. It's enough to show that this is an isomorphism. So it's enough to show that a triangulated functor is an equivalence on generating objects to gener to deduce it as an equivalence. Okay. So on left hand side, hom i is zero for i bigger than or equal to zero by projectivity. And it's just hom in perverse sheaves i equals zero. And the right hand side hom i. So we'd like to say that this is the same thing. This is zero because um, Okay, we can build up P of lambda in, in terms of delta modules, and each of these delta modules has no higher homs to nabla modules, and this is, a, this is by a junction. And in degree zero, this is just hom in dbc of P lambda. Capital P.
okay? And so these are equal. Jordi, can you yeah. repeat why the P lambdas generate? Ah, so so you're happy with the deltas and the mu's generating? Mm -hmm. So now um, I can express, so the top P lambda is just a delta of lambda. And so, mm -hmm. and then the next, the next top P mu is a delta of mu plus a number of copies of delta of lambda. And I've already got delta of lambda in my collection. So now I've got delta of mu in my collection. Mm -hmm. So it's just the, the fact that the P, P lambda is the upper triangular in the delta of lambda. Mm -hmm which is this key property of being a highest rate category. In the last line, it should be uh, Nabla instead of Delta, sub mu. Yes, thank you. Okay. So I really like this proof because it, it kind of, um, it's it's a general it's a general general technique that you have some functor, and then um, you choose some very special objects, and at the end of the day, you want to want to know that it induces so induces an equivalence on these generating objects, and if you have an interesting equivalence, then the reason why why things are zero will be quite different on both both sides, and here we see that the reason on each side is rather different. You have an algebraic reason on the left-hand side and a topological reason on the right-hand side. Yeah, so this here I used, um, of course, I mean, I, I, I hope this is obvious to you, but I used um, wrong exact sequence. Yep. Okay, so now um, we've, we're ending constructible sheets for some time. And I just want to explain where we're going for the next um, few weeks. Are there any more questions on this? Okay. So where are we going? So I want to recall um, things that I've been over already, but this was some time ago. So we have a root system. And to this, we can associate a finite file group finite simple reflections this is the, and we consider w which is w f the affine bar group And we can also associate to this um, G and G check um, Langland's tool over C. And now we have the um, H, the affine Hecker algebra.
Then we have at center, which is identified with the W invariance in the, sorry. The W invariance in the co-character does. And this is of course the same thing as the um, representation ring of G check, which is the growth and D group of coherent sheaves on point on G check. And now, um, we have the um, the G times C star equivariant K theory of the Steinberg variety, and we have a pullback here. And one of the main kind of um, motivational theorems for this course is the fact that one has an isomorphism here, which I'll call um, KL, and this is Kajdanlistic isomorphism. And this description of the center over here is this is due to Bernstein. And we've already we've already seen this arrow. And the Kajdanlistic isomorphism is the fact that there exists an isomorphism making this diagram commutative. And um, now we come to Bezrel Kamnikov's equivalence that I've stated in some more precise way in previous lectures, but we will get to it. Um, we will get to so basically, so this is an this is the affine Hecker algebra associated to G, and its origin lies in a certain algebra of functions on the loop group of G. And so this has a very natural categorification via the so-called constructible affine Hecker category. So this is constructible sheaves on the affine flag variety. plus variance. And we have passage to the growth and D group here. I'll draw this as a squiggly arrow. And so this is a um, monoidal category. And then we have the coherent affine Hecker category. So this is certain coherent sheaves, so equivariant coherent sheaves on the Steinberg plus variance. And this also has a convolution product. And so a basic point is 
somehow we, we have an isomorphism between two things that are very naturally growth and groups. And so we would like to have um, an equivalence between these monoidal categories. And this equivalence is Petro Kamnikov's equivalence. And uh, what I haven't explained, but I've stated repeatedly, is that um, this casualistic isomorphism can be used to establish the so-called deline langlands conjectures um, about classifications of certain um, irreducible representations of the p-adic group associated to G. And so, and you can think about such an isomorphism as fundamentally giving you really um, fundamental new knowledge about the representation theory of this affine Hecker algebra. So this is, you can think about this affine Hecker algebra as basically something that kind of occurs and is something that pops up at you in nature. And understanding such an isomorphism with something like this reveals a lot of the structure here that is not apparent. So for example, we discussed a little bit that you have this very interesting cell filtration over here. And this, um, this is a manifestation of the filtration by a nilpotent orbits over here. So this is the kind of side that jumps up at you. And this is the side that you would like to, um, like to have in order to understand the representation theory. And Bezra Kamnikov's equivalence is similar in the sense that this, he this Hecker category occurs throughout representation theory. And in order to understand it, we would like to um, establish such an equivalence. There's something over here. Okay. Excuse me, Jordi. When you say yeah. invariance, is that like a G equivariant setting or like what, what are these variants that you're talking so, about? So um, <clears throat> basically what I mean is that this is, this will not literally be um, certain equivariant constructible sheaves on the affine flag variety. What we'll have to do is pass to some cover and look at some things with unipotent monodromy and blah, 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 blah. Um, and on the other side, this will not literally be um, equivariant coherent sheaves on the Steinberg variety. We'll have to look at um, the growth and deep resolution and look at sheaves supported on certain sub varieties inside here. So in some sense, you can look at these two things as being the way the way that this is what kind of first jumped up at mathematicians on the level of growth and deep group in the 1980s. And at that point, Ginsburg suggested there should be a monodal category equivalence underlying this isomorphism. But somehow the one of the reasons that this is so difficult to actually achieve is that you need to change both sides. Um, and, you know, changing one side is hard enough to make it right, but having to alter both sides um, it's really very complicated and that's why it took um, Roman some time to work out what's going on here. Are there other questions on this slide? Uh, just one question, Jordi. Um, yeah. This arrow labeled pullback, is it already clear that that should be injective um, without knowing the other isomorphisms and the commutativity? Uh, yeah. Um, because, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a natural sub variety inside here, um, which you can pull back to and you have a commutative diagram. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's clear with, um, it's not difficult. Yeah. Um, and somehow, I mean, I, I think I explained prior to Christmas that why this is, it's very natural to expect this to be the center on this side. Whereas over here, this was kind of a, a surprising theorem. So the general strategy, so, um, so we should understand
Okay. So uh, th this casualistic isomorphism is still difficult. I don't think anybody has really written down a, an easy account of this. Um, and so our, our first goal will be to understand this. And I want to understand how kind of, I want to explain how understanding this leads to the first step in understanding B, understanding bezel kamnikovs equivalence. So the general strategy It's kind of remarkable. So, so the first one is kind of um, relatively straightforward. So you define, so we use the Bernstein presentation of the affine Hecker algebra, and so we would like to define a morphism of algebras, and we 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 say where the Bernstein generators go. So the Ti goes to some class called Qi, and this is to be explained next time. And the um, theta lambda, so these are the loop pieces of the Bernstein presentation, go to O lambda, which is the pullback. So, so lambda is a co-character. So it's a character of the dual torus. So it naturally gives us a line bundle on, um, on, G, mod, on G check mod B check. To the cotangent bundle of G check mod B check, and this sits naturally inside the Steinberg as the diagonal. So I've explained in previous lectures you can think about the Steinberg as being something like a matrix algebra, and things on this diagonal are something like diagonal matrices. And so coherent sheaves on this diagonal. Um, uh, like diagonal matrices, so you think this, you, you should expect this to be a large commutative subalgebra, which is exactly what this Bernstein presentation tells us that it is. So we define this on ge generators, and it's, um, and it's kind of remarkable that it's very challenging. to check relations directly. Okay. Um, so CF um, Leonardo Maltoni, so he gave a talk in the informal Friday cinema, seminar last year. Um, So he checked these relations for SL2, and it's a check, and it's uh, it's surprisingly unenlightening. I find this check. Um, so we would like to know that the relations hold. And now comes a really nice bit of the story, which is that this affine Hecker algebra. has two important modules, which are constructed as follows. So we take the, the, the trivial representation of the finite Hecker algebra. So did I define the finite Hecker algebra? No, I didn't. So this is the
So by that I mean the Hecker algebra of the finite Baal group. To Z Q plus or minus one that sends Ti to Q. So this is the deformation of the trivial representation. Yeah, when Q equals one, it's just the trivial representation. And sine which sends Ti to minus one. And then we form um, M, which is the induction from this trivial module up to the whole um, Hecker algebra. And note that this is, um, and N is the So this is the um, so this is called a spherical module. So this language spherical and anti-spherical module, as I understand it, comes from um, the representation theory of periodic groups where these these guys first showed up and note that um, we have the Bernstein presentation which tells us that as vector spaces this is a tensor product plus or minus one tensor with HF, so hence, as modules over the um, this big community of subalgebra, M is isomorphic to N is isomorphic to So these are sometimes called um, polynomial modules. That's a probably her horrible term terminology, so I won't use it. I'll... But anyway, so um, so what is this space? This is basically the space of um, it's a space of Laurent polynomials over a over a function field in Q. And the 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 statement is that there's some very interesting action of the affine Hecker algebra on this um, essentially a polynomial ring. Okay. And then, uh, so that's step two. And step three is that the um, convolution formalism so remember that we had this um, we have the Springer resolution of the nilpotent cone and basically any closed subvariety any G, G check invariant closed subvariety inside here leads to a module over the convolution algebra of this. So this um, tells us that both uh, that if we take this G check times C, C star equivariant K theory of the Steinberg variety, this acts on both the G check times C star equivariant cohomology of G check mod B check. So that's the zero fiber under the Springer resolution. Or it also acts on everything.
And now note, whoops. So T star G mod G, G check mod B check is a equivalent vector bundle on G check mod B check. And so, of G check what B check is isomorphic by a pullback and this in turn is isomorphic to the um, B check times C star recurrent um, K theory of a point. Which is I check where this is the C star bit and this is the B check bit. Okay. So we have two natural modules for the affine Hecker algebra, which look like um, essentially polynomial rings. And we have two natural modules for this um, K theory of the Steinberg variety, and both of them look basically like polynomial rings. And now the fourth step is to compute the action in generators in um, M and match it with KG check times C star of G check mod B check, and similarly for N, and match it with K and finally um, M N so these are all faithful modules So it's a kind of remarkable way of showing that two algebras are isomorphic. You show that they both have a faithful model, as bo both have a faithful module in which the generators act in the same way. Okay. So another way of saying it is that both of these algebras are given by some infinite dimensional matrices and these matrices just happen to be the same. Therefore, the algebras are isomorphic. All faithful modules, so this implies I shall see guys more. Okay. Um, so, Jordi, why do we need two modules? I mean, this. Yeah, we don't. Okay. I'm just doing it for symmetry. And in fact, you don't. You like, um, yeah, we, we, yeah, we only need one module. Um, and I guess. N and K. Okay. Um, and yeah, so, and, and the action is given by some formulas that were discovered by Lustig called Demasio Lustig formulas that are quite remarkable. Um, I mean, when you first see them, you never believe that this is going to give you an action in the affine Hecker algebra. Um, well, I don't anyway. Um, and then I, do I have three minutes? Yes, I do have three minutes. Okay. Um, so this will be, so one, two, three, four.
will be next week. And somehow this approach, so it's remarkable that we, we, we I mean, this is a remarkable approach to showing an isomorphism. And it also shows that if you want to show an equivalence, you're probably also going to have quite a lot of difficulty. And what um, Roman starts by doing is trying to categorify. So, um, first step. is the following. So we have this N and this is isomorphic to KG times C star, the equivariant K theory of the cotangent bundle. And now this is naturally the Grothendieck group of and now it turns out that this guy over here also has a very natural categorification this is categorical. And his spherical module. And then um, there's a theorem due to Akhipov which is that you have an equivalence across here. Okay. And just as establishing this isomorphism is key to getting the isomorphism of the Kajanistic, the Kajanistic equivalence, it's essentially immediate, establishing this isomorphism is the key first step. And the AB theorem will occupy us. Okay, so next week is somehow the, the level of growth in the groups already very subtle. And I hope this week I don't get totally, um, go totally crazy with some of these calculations that need to be done. Um, but anyway, in, in rough outline, I hope to explain that. And then uh, probably there'll be at least two weeks on Akipov Bezrokamnikov. And um, I find the proof of this absolutely remarkable. It's the most kind of it's a it's a deep equivalence, but the proof is incredibly soft. It's it's like he's kind of they're not doing very much the whole time, and then suddenly they have this um, equivalence staring at staring at them. Okay. So that's it for today. Let me know if you if there's any questions.